How many of you guys uh, have used Symphony a decent bit? Good, yeah, so two thirds, good, that's good. How many of you use PHP Storm? Even more? How many of you are using the Symphony plugin for PHP Storm? Good, most of you. If you're not, uh, go ahead and install and download that. You can just Google for how to do it, or since a lot of hands went up, um, just ask, you know, look at the person next to you, make sure you have that installed. And the gotcha with that is it needs to be enabled on a project by project basis. So if you've used that, you probably already know that. So if you haven't installed, when you open PHP Storm on this project, make sure you go into settings and actually enable it. And when you do that, actually I'll show you up here. There it is. Um, so you can see I have mine enabled. That's my PHP Storm settings because I have the Symphony plugin enabled. And on this project, the first three boxes, you normally let those use the default values in Symphony. But this project is a little bit of a different Symphony project. If you were in our Doctrine workshop this morning, you already saw this. So I took the word app out of the beginning. So normally, those three boxes start with app slash cache. And the third box there has the word app in it. So when you enable the plugin, take app, A-P-P, out of those first three boxes so that they match my boxes up there. So I'll just have like an extra app in the beginning. And then hit save. Makes doing Symphony a lot more fun. Cool, and obviously the goal is to get my silly website up for this workshop. So we'll make sure everyone is at least at that spot. I'm going to put the URL back up for the setup. Cool. Once you have it working, just look around the project a little bit. Uh, I'm giving you guys a project, and we're going to be refactoring it, making some changes. So get familiar with what's in there so that when we make changes, it makes sense, like why we might do something. How many of you were in the Doctrine workshop this morning? Yeah, okay, like a third of you. So like a few things with the project, you'll hear me repeat. So for those of you that have used Symphony, and if you were in the Doctrine workshop, you are not allowed to answer this. So shh. If you've used Symphony and you look at the project, what's different about this project than a normal Symphony project? Yep. There's no app folder. Yeah, there's no app folder. Number one, no app folder. So app config, all that stuff. Everything in app has moved up one directory. So whatever is normally in app, app resources, app console is just up one directory. Why? Because I just made a smaller symphony for this workshop. Um, so it's just still symphony, it's just smaller. There's two other changes, more or less. What else is different? Everyone's trying to remember what a normal symphony project looks like. There's one other directory that's there that's not normally there. Yeah, that's it. There's no source directory. But there is an app bundle directory. So same thing, app bundle, src slash app bundle. It's just been moved up because, you know, if you have less directories, it looks easier. So we want to make, make it look easy. Um, it's perceived complexity. When, if you add a lot of directories and show somebody a project, they'll be like, oh, that's really hard, where it's just a bunch of directories. Um, and then the third thing is, in the config directory, there's just less configuration files. So normally in a Symfony project, there's an app config services.yml. We just have a config slash config.yml. Anything you do in that services file, you can do in this configuration file. If you want to know how that works later, you can ask me. But it's just a smaller, less files, but everything is still basically normal Symfony. Cool? So this is like my little micro Symfony edition. Um, because it makes things easier, and also if you've used Symfony, it's kind of a new thing to look at. You can go, oh, this is a little different. So it's kind of cool. All right. Oh, uh, all these, um, so I'm going to take us through slides, slides with air quotes, because I don't really like slides. Instead, I just show things in my editor and really giant font up here. But all of these are inside the slides directory in your project. So if you are, can't see something or want to work ahead, there's also extra credit on a lot of them, which I may or may not show, but you can do the extra credit. So go into the slides directory and just grab, you know, open those up and you have them.
Ah, yes, there's one more change I forgot to mention, which has nothing to do with my workshop, but it's really cool stuff. There's no parameters.yml file. So where, what, what, what do I have, though, that replaces that? Some people might be familiar with this. I have no parameters.yml file, but I have something else that's taking its place. Yes, .env, and how is that working? Are you familiar with the .env? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, like you can set environment parameters. A lot of times you'll hear, like in Apache, in Apache configuration in your virtual host, you can actually set environmental variables, and then in PHP you can access those. So sometimes that's the way people will store their database credentials instead of in a file. So the .env just stores, just has, you see it's just a very simple file. And then there's a library with it by the same name. It's called .env, D-O-T-E-N-V that parses that file, reads everything inside of it, and turns them into environment variables. So it's an alternate way of doing configuration. If you've ever used Laravel, they use this in Laravel, and lots of people use it. I like it, it's a little smaller, it's a little bit different, so it's just something else new to look at um, inside of the project. And if we have time, I might talk about that more later, but it's extra credit. All right, so the project, which is very serious, is all about ships battling each other. So you have ships, and you can hit start battle, and they will battle each other. Um, I kind of wanted to do some sort of animation, but I didn't get to that, where it like flies across and explodes. So it just tells you who the winner is. Um, there are four important classes. Haha. -ha. Well, a little more readable. There are four, four important classes that I want you guys to look at, and they're all, everything we're going to do pretty much is inside that app bundle directory. So app bundle slash model, and app bundle slash service, that's where this stuff is. So you have a normal ship class, which is just a ship, it holds data, doesn't do much. If you use doctrine, it's kind of similar to a doctrine entity um, in its simplicity. Then you have ship loader, which is a class that helps query things from the database. There's no doctrine in this on purpose, because I want us to just do things, keep things very simple and focus on the object-oriented stuff. There's ship loader, it queries for ships. Battle manager is what actually figures out when two things battle, who wins. And then there's one called random ship selector, which is just a little class that you say, give me a random ship, and it goes and grabs a random ship. So when you click battle, you know, it uses that to grab the two random ships. And if you want to see how this is working, of course, it's in the controller directory. I think there's a ship controller in there, and it's got like the two endpoints for making this happen. Cool? I want you guys first to look at the ship loader. So open up the ship loader class. And what we're going to do through this workshop is kind of just refactor and improve things. So I want you guys to think about how we can improve things. I'm going to pose problems to you and say, what's wrong with this? And what are some possible solutions? I'll tell us eventually what I want you to do. But anything we do, there might be multiple ways to improve the code. We'll ultimately sort of pick one and run down there. But I want you guys' thoughts. So in ship loader, is there anything that really stands out as ugly to anybody? See a nod right there. You didn't say it, but what's up? What's, what's ugly inside of ship loader? Get PDO. Yeah, yeah, get PDO. That function, specifically what's inside of that function, because that's where we're instantiating in our PDO object and our connection object to the database. So and what's, what's ugly about that? Perfect, yeah. Yeah, perfect, yeah. Obviously, we want to have that in one central location. If we do this in every file, we'll have 500 database connections, and our database credentials will be duplicated. I know we're all like, yeah, that's silly, but I actually see that. I get to do consulting. I see this all the time. Um, it's not a problem in reality, because I just say never change your database password, whatever you do, because you have it in 500 places in your code. Um, so how could, we, how could we improve this? There's lots of answers to this, but what could we do? Dependency injection? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. So, and what do you mean by dependency injection? I think probably all of us have heard that term, but what would that, what would specifically you do? Yeah, we could, we could create a, a service that would instantiate a database with, with some parameters and then inject this one into, the ser into this service, into this chip loader stuff. Yes, and we could, we could inject just the PDO object into this. Yeah, at first, yeah. At first, yeah, and then you could wrap it, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. So the first thing is we need to get the instantiation of the PDO object out of here. And obviously the only way to do that is to have somebody else create it and pass it in. Okay, so 
Um, for people that have done more dependency injection, because that's the first thing we're going to talk about, you're going to already see like the second and third steps ahead. We're just going to take it a piece at a time. So go to my Aha. So first thing I want to do is we're just going to move the PDO instantiation, not to anywhere magical. We're just going to move it into our controller. Because ultimately, the ship loader object is being instantiated in our ship controller. That's where we say new uh, ship loader. Um, so what we're going to do is move the instantiation of the PDO object into there, and then pass it to the ship loader via its constructor. Those are somewhat vague instructions, because I don't want to give the exact like, steps away at first. So the steps kind of are listed below, though. So we, obviously, in the ship loader now, we're going to need a construct function so that we can pass the PDO object into that. And then we'll move the instantiation of the PDO into the controller. So we'll move it up one layer. If that doesn't make any sense at all, uh, you know, raise your hand or just scream at me or flip over your table. That will get my attention. So everything should still work, but we're just going to move things up a layer. And I will give, if you're a little confused, I will give more specific directions in a second, but I want to give everyone a second to kind of think about this. So what's the first thing that people are doing? Somebody that knows where they're going with this. I see some busy faces. What's the first thing you're doing? Constructor. Constructor, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the first thing I would do too. First thing is I would say, hey, my ship loader needs to have a public function construct, and it needs to have a single argument to it, which is going to be a PDO object, because that'll be our way to pass it in. And then in that constructor, in that construct function, you're just going to take the PDO variable and set it on the PDO property. And of course, you'll need to update the get PDO function because it doesn't need to instantiate the PDO object anymore. So I'm guessing most of you have done this type of thing either many times or at least a few times. I'm guessing most of you have heard by this point like dependency injection. Dependency injection is who's familiar with like who, who, who's familiar with that term? Okay, a little bit less than I expected. Yeah. So when they say dependency injection, it's this process. And if it doesn't, that doesn't make sense yet, wait till we get this kind of working code here. I'll put it up on the board in a second. Um, but it's the idea of, hey, instead of instantiating PDO inside of ship loader, someone else will instantiate it and we'll just pass it in through the constructor, usually through the constructor. So I'm going to make you guys do this first before I show it. Awesome. Oh, interesting. I think a lot of you, or most of you, have, have that part already. Make that even a little bigger. So that's the idea of dependency injection. Um, dependency injection sounds like it does something. Like, oh, something's being injected. It's not really. It's just you creating a constructor. Which, of course, means whenever you instantiate a new ship loader, you're forced to pass it everything it needs. Which sort of makes sense. If you call a function like add, you would, of course, pass it two numbers to add together. So it's the same thing with a class. If a class needs a database connection or some other object, you just pass those objects to your, your object. May I ask one question? Yeah. So what would be the advantage of passing the PDO object in the ship loader constructor versus 
instantiating it there and simplifying the instantiation of ship loader itself. So if we, if we move uh, this parameter and create PD object inside the constructor, uh, uh, ship loader will be easier to use, right? It will be easier to what? Easier to instantiate. Yeah, yeah, good, 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 yeah. yeah. And so what are the pros and cons of having it uh, injected versus creating it um, in, the, in the constructor? Can someone answer that? Yeah, so like why is, this, why is this way a little bit better than what we had before? We sort of already answered it. Because what, what was one of the problems with what we had before? Uh, okay, because you have only one instance of the same object and you wouldn't, uh, and you would like to avoid creating and passing all the passwords, all the host names and users uh, to all the objects in 500 places in the code. So probably you would like to create only one place where you create the object or at least uh, the definition of the object and pass this object to some another uh, classes. So that's why we inject... Uh, small pieces of the code into another parts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. That's a good question, but Doesn't what if if we don't have any parameters? What if this is some class that don't require any configuration? Uh, you would like to create one, uh, a class with a single responsibility, uh, which takes care about a single thing, and if these things will change, you can change it in the one place, not in 500. And what about testing? You test only one class, uh, not 500. <laughs> yes, and you are able to... A class uh, to test only single thing, single responsibility, so it's much, much easier than test a 500 lines uh, controller or an action. And you can mock your dependencies. Of you, course. Because if you lock it inside, you are not able to mock it, right? Great, thank you. All right, cool. Oh, and the controller code. What's the controller code look like now? What changes did you guys make to the controller? Somebody that has it. Kind of two changes. What's the controller code? What do I need to add to my controller? Yeah, the uh, construction uh, parameter to all of these instantiations, like new ship loader. Uh, and 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 the uh, PDO and the uh, brackets and, and and just for ju just for easier access, I actually moved the get get PDO function to the controller at this stage. With nice, the nice, function. nice. Cool, so cool, you can cool. just simply this get PDO. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, pretty simple. And then, yeah, kind of the, the, the extra credit, which ultimately won't be good enough, but the extra credit on this is to move that into a private function, which is what you did. So, you know, if you copied the private function out of ship loader into this class, then you could say PDO equals this arrow, get PDO, which has the teeny tiny advantage that if on the same request you called that multiple times, because it was setting on a property, it wouldn't create multiple PDO objects, because it just only created it on the first try. All right, cool. If you have any issues, let me know, but I wanna, I'll keep rolling us forward. It's a small step. Oh, so now, what's, uh, okay, so I, I made you guys, some of you guys that know this are, like I said, already thinking three steps ahead. Um, so I made a stop here, so now what's the next problem? And the problem at this time is in our controller. Or I should ask that a different way. What's the problem with having the PDO instantiation in the controller? Yep. Uh, you may also have a dozen or a few hundred controllers yeah. that need the same database connection. I like that you, you, answered, the, you answered both questions. Uh, can they, and they have the same answer, right? You're like, okay, cool, it's not locked up inside the ship loader, but the PDO is now locked up inside of your controller. So that's going to be a problem. Obviously, we want to share it with our whole project. Yep, yep, yep. Cool. And those of you that have used Symphony before, you're going to be familiar with this step. If you haven't, um, check your neighbor, Google for it, or we'll help you out. Again, my instructions here will be vague. So the solution then is to have moved the service into, well, one way or another, we want to move the instantiation of the PDO object into a very central spot. 
If you use Symfony or really any modern framework, they have a container called a service container. How many people are familiar with, like, how many people, like, how many people more or less understand what a service container is? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, that's, that's pretty good. So I like to think of it as, it doesn't, this doesn't do it justice, um, but it, it's basically what it is. It's a, a big array of all of the useful objects in your system. So to back up, you'll hear me use the word service. Service means a useful object. I'll talk more about that later. But any object that does some work, we kind of call it a service. That doesn't mean anything special about it. So ship loader does some work, so we call it a service. It's already a service. Just by it being an object or a class that does work, it's a service. So the service container is basically in a big, giant, associative array full of all of the useful objects in your project, like maybe a PDO object and a ship loader object and a battle manager object. It has all those objects in there, and because it's an associative array, they all have keys, little nicknames, whatever you make up. And then you have this big giant container object, well, array. It's actually an object, but think of it like an associative array. You have this big giant container, and you kind of, if you have that, you have access to any useful object in the system. I can give you the container, and you can say, oh, I know that the ship loader is in, I put that object in the container. I gave it the nickname ship underscore loader, so I could just ask for the object called ship underscore loader, and it will return me that object. So it's a way to centralize the, uh, all of the objects, useful objects in your system. So like I said, most modern frameworks come with a service container or a dependency injection container. Um, and this step is just taking that PDO object, the instantiation of that, and putting it into the service container. In other words, instead of us saying new PDO, we're gonna, put, we're gonna have the container say new PDO. So that in our controller, we can just say, hey container, can you please give me the PDO object? And it will say, okay, yeah, one second, new PDO, and it go, okay, here you go, here it is, okay? In a normal, traditional Symfony project, I mean, you can do it in lots of places. This is done in app config services.yml. We're just gonna do it with one configuration file, so we're just gonna do it in config slash config.yml. And I already have one service registered in there, so you can kind of see what it looks like if you're not familiar. And I have the two steps up there because you'll need to modify two files in this step. And if I'm not making sense or some of this is really new to you, let me know. I'm you know, sort of purposely not giving you guys the exact code initially. If you don't know, you can always Google for it. We have a lot of Symfony documentation. The end goal here is everything should still work, but you don't have the new PDO in your controller anymore. Yeah, that's it. If you've done some symphony stuff before, this step was probably pretty easy to you. If you've never done that before, it might look a little weird or a little awkward. So basically, we need to teach Symfony's container how to instantiate our object. And obviously, what does it need to know? It needs another class name. It needs another constructor arguments. So this is exactly what we're doing here. We're saying one of those services, one of those useful objects in the container, its class is PDO. And its first argument is MySQL, blah, blah, blah. Second argument is Summer. Third argument is Camp. So that's all it needs to know on how to instantiate that object. What's the significance of the my summer camp PDO? People that have done this before? Yep. It's an arbitrary name that you can use, but it must be unique. This is how you will call or fetch your service from the container. Perfect. So it's an arbitrary name. Very important. Obviously, mine is really stupid. Um, so there's my silly name. Uh, and it, it just needs to be unique in your project across your services. And this is what we'll do when we want to get that service out. So if you've used Symfony, you've seen that before. So when we 
want this service, we're going to ask for my summer camp PDO. That's what we'll ask for from the container. So again, it's an associative array. We have a key called my summer camp PDO, which is set to that PDO object. So our services in the container, our useful object is in the container. It's just a matter of knowing how the heck do I get this container so I can fetch it back out. In Symfony, in controllers, if you want to know like the kung fu magic behind how this happens, then grab me at the break. Uh, but for now, just take it as absolute faith. When you're in the controller, you will have a container property. That is the container object. The container basically has all of one useful method on it called git. So that's the only change in the controller. You don't have to instantiate the PDO object anymore. You just ask the container for the PDO object using whatever key you used up there. Cool. There's actually one other method on the container called git parameter, which is like configuration things. So that's also important. But 99% of the time, it's just git. You can't do anything with it. It's just git. Like, it's an associative array, basically, glorified associative array. Um, people that have done this before, let me ask you this way. Why, if I, get a, if I eventually have a big project that has like a thousand services in it, why doesn't that slow down my project? Who said it? Yeah, say it again. Yeah, lazy loaded, meaning... Exactly, yeah. So the service is instantiated only when and if you ask for it the first time. So it's not really an array of useful objects. It's an array of potential useful objects. It's an array of instructions on how to create those useful objects if and when somebody actually asks for them. So you can have a giant container with a million services, and it doesn't slow your project down. Um, so and obviously, this is a pretty simple one. But you know, one nice thing is if this service required another service to be loaded, we could ask for the PDO service, and it would go instantiate any other services that it needs to before it returns the PDO back to us. All right. If, uh, real quick, if I want to get a list of all the services in my project, what, what, what do I do? A couple different ways. Yes, container debug. So, and I usually app console, but in our case, it's just console. So you can go to the t command line and run console container colon debug. Or actually, now we renamed it to debug colon container. The old one still works. But if you want to be really trendy and use the new stuff, debug colon container. And that's going to give you the list of all the things in the service container. So these are all the tools you have in your project. And if you go through that list, you're going to see um, our service in there. And you can even, it has like a little search thing. So like you could say PDO in the end, and it's going to like do a search inside the services for PDO, and then you can like pick the one that you want. Except I think that has a bug right now. Cool. So this is your place to go to see all the useful services. This is a little bit Symfony specific, but in Symfony, if you, because I want to keep it mostly like on OO, but a mixture with Symfony. In Symfony, if you install like a third party bundle, that third party bundle might do a lot of things for you. It might add routes to your system or other things. But the number one job that usually a bundle does, like the reason you bring it in, is because it adds more services to your service container. So, for example, we don't have it in this project, but if you wanted to use Doctrine in your project, you install the Doctrine bundle. That basically just adds a bunch of doctrine services to your service container, things like the connection object. So you can fetch them out of the container and use them. So it's all about kind of getting more tools into that service container. All right, how many of you have looked at Symfony's cached container before? A few of you, yeah, good, good. So in your project, you have a cache directory 
which you're not supposed to normally look into, you know, because obviously we don't need to modify things in here. Inside of there, the first file, if I believe, yep. Well, the first file that looks like that inside of there is called Easy Summer Camp Project Dev Debug Container.php. Really long name, but it's, it ends in container.php. So this is an app slash cache. So go ahead and open that up. I'm actually going to put the um, path over here for you guys. So open cache slash dev slash easy summer. Easy summer camp dev debug. Actually, you guys, this might be called, is, it, is your guys called like OOP? Yep. Yeah. Something like that. OOP dev debug project container.php. Okay. It figures out the name by um, whatever directory your kernel is in. If you're a Symfony nerd and you're curious about that. So because your directory is called OOP, it's naming the class like that. So when we want to configure services, we go to this config.yml or service.yml. We have all these service keys. But ultimately, when you say this arrow container, that object, that service object, is this class. So I'm going to flip over here. I'll rename mine to look like your guys's. So this is actually the container object. So Symfony reads all these configuration files with all these information about the services and ultimately physically writes this PHP file. So if you search for PDO, first thing you'll do is you'll find this like associative array, this method map thing. Just search next, because I want to find the actual method. And you should end up finding something like this. The function name won't be the same. My service in this project was called app underscore PDO. So like, you know, the thing is called git app PDO service. If you called your service just PDO, it'll just be called git PDO service. It's not really important. The point is, when you say this arrow container arrow git app underscore PDO, because that's what I called mine, so yours is a little bit different, this is the function that's called internally, which contains the exact code that you just moved out of your controller, like verbatim. So ultimately, somebody has to instantiate a new object and pass it arguments. And it's actually done in raw PHP code behind the scenes. So you don't necessarily need to know this, but it's a good reminder, like this is ultimately what's happening. And if you were messing with service configuration and couldn't get it right or weren't sure what was going on, you could actually just open this file and see what is this all compiling down to and why isn't it quite right yet. This is also why the service container is really fast because it doesn't have to, it just uses, once this is built, obviously, it just uses this file on production over and over and over again. So there's no, you know, it doesn't read the configuration files or anything like that. Cool? All right. Uh -huh. All right, there was one thing on our PDO object that we had a second ago and we lost it. It was a subtle thing. We were calling a method on it. Yeah. There was a set, set attribute call. Yeah, I had a, we had a set attribute call. We said PDO equals new PDO. Then we said PDO arrow set attribute. And it basically tells PDO, like, if you have an error, actually throw an exception instead of, like, doing whatever it normally does, which I think is, like, I don't know, just kind of throw a warning that you never see. So I kind of want that back. I want it to throw exceptions. So the issue is that so far the service container just all it does is just call new on your object and pass it arguments. We now need it to call new, pass it arguments, and then call a method on it afterwards. We don't want to have to do this in our, we could do it in our controller, right? We could say PDO equals this arrow container arrow get PDO, and then we could say PDO arrow set attribute. We could do it there, but we want to do it globally. We also have the risk of what if something else made a query before that and it had an error, you know, it's a little bit too late. So we want to do this inside of the central service configuration. And I'm not going to have you guys guess how to do this. If you've seen it before, then you've, then you've seen it. So in addition to the minimum of a service is you have to have the class and you have to have the arguments. Well, if there's no arguments, all you have to have is the class key in, in your service configuration. You can also configure different methods to be called on it afterwards. And the, key, the way you do that is by using a calls key. 
So you can basically say, after you instantiate PDO, call these three functions on it before you return it from the container. So that's what we want to do. We want to have a call set attribute. And for now, one other tricky part about this is that the set attribute function we were using before we use, was using constants like this. That PDO ATTR error mode was the first argument and the other one was the second argument. Well, constants aren't going to work inside of a YAML file. So if you put those inside of the YAML file, it's literally going to pass those in as strings. We're going to fix that in a second. It's kind of a cool thing. But for now, we're gonna, you need to use like, the numbers that these equate to, two and three, as like, the arguments to this method. Okay? So I'm going to show you guys how to do this one because it's just a matter of like, what is, what's the format look like. I was debating on this. With YAML, there's always two different ways to do the same thing. So I was debating in my head which one I wanted to do. The downside of calls is that its syntax in YAML is really weird. But it's a fairly straightforward operation. What we want is it to call the set attribute method and pass it the arguments two and three before it returns the PDO object from us. So it does have a weird syntax. There's actually a different syntax you can use for this as well but that's what you do. So the way that you could know this is working, other than when you refresh your page, it doesn't explode. Because if it does explode, it's not working yet. But if it doesn't explode, it's probably working. You could open up your cached container file again, look at that method, and you should actually see a new line in there that says you know, something like PDO arrow set attribute two comma three. You should see that cached container file actually mutate dynamically. It's getting rewritten by Symfony because we modified this file. Yep. Is a fourth parameter? Yeah. Let's see what you're talking about. So get this up there. Check your cache container file again. Make sure you have that set attribute function being called in there. All right. Most people have this working. Um, how many people have the extra credit working? A couple people? So the extra credit was basically fix it so that I don't have to put two and three in there. I can actually use the constants, the proper constant values, which won't work automatically. So what I want to do is that, but that will literally pass the string in, which is not going to be helpful for us, because that is a string. This is not PHP code. So somebody that has the extra credit done, um, what do I put here? It's, did I have that right? Yeah. It's a little feature in Symfony, which even I don't use that often. It's really handy when you need it, though. So the, the syntax is, I don't always remember the syntax. Symfony has a component called the expression language, which is a very, it's a little language that's very twig-like, has functions, and you can say like, you know, product.name, things like that. So in a few parts of Symfony, you can use the expression uh, language to do certain things. So in most places inside of um, the service files, inside of the service configuration, instead of putting a real argument, you can put at equals, that's kind of the way that you tell Symfony, hey, I'm about to use an expression, not just a normal thing. And then you follow that with an expression. And depending on where you're using the expression language in Symfony, there are different functions and variables available to you there. So for example, inside of here, actually everywhere, there's a constant function. Also inside of here, there's a get service function, I think, if you wanted to actually get out another service. So there's all kinds of weird things that you can do um, dynamically to using this little dynamic language inside of uh, um, PHP. Ultimately, this will compile down into your cache container using the PHP equivalent of that expression, which happens to actually be 
very similar to this. The way you'd write that in PHP is constant. You'd use the constant function in PHP, constant, open parentheses, and then that string. So that's what you'd see inside of there. Cool. So if, you're, if, you, if you like that or you want to learn more about that, uh, if you Google KNP University service expressions, we have a blog post on that where we do a couple um, interesting things. And then, of course, do the same thing below that. Oh, that's not right. Here we go. Okay. Let's keep going. So identify problems with our application. So the next problem, I mean, there's problems everywhere, right? I didn't do a very good job on this code, so I apologize. So um, I'll point you to where the problems in the order that I want you to find them. Um, <clears throat> inside of our controller, um, well, actually, this is pretty easy. I don't even have to ask you. Like, it's, it, we just basically did it. Inside of our controller, we're still instantiating the ship loader object. That has two, has a couple disadvantages. One is we've already listed, right? One is that what if you need the ship loader elsewhere? Um, you're kind of instantiating it right in this one spot. It's not as big of a problem as the PDO because we know that PDO makes a database connection. So instantiating multiple PDOs is a huge problem. Instal instantiating multiple ship loaders, eh, that's less of a problem. It's, it's extra memory, but it's not the end of the world. It's not like it's making an extra database connection. Um, but there are, well, that's one disadvantage is if we can avoid having multiple ship loaders on the same request, we might as well avoid that because we don't want to have extra memory if we don't need it. We only need one shiploader object. There's a second disadvantage to instantiating the shiploader inside of our controller, which a lot of you will know, but I won't ask because it's a weird abstract question. It's the fact that when we started the project, all we had to do was say new shiploader. Then we refactored stuff, and all of a sudden it had a constructor argument. So we had to go to the two parts of our code, and you may not even have realized that shiploader is also instantiated in the other method at the bottom the other controller method, you had to go to both, both of those places and make sure you passed in the constructor argument. So the disadvantage of instantiating the shiploader object in this case is that if you have new shiploader in 25 places in your code and you decide tomorrow that it has a second constructor argument, then you have to go to all 25 places in your code and add the second constructor argument to shiploader. So not the end of the world, but like that kind of sucks too. All right? So for that reason, I want you guys to move shiploader also into the service container. And this one should be pretty easy. It'll follow the same pattern. So let me put that slide up here. In fact, we're going to do it for ship loader and our random ship selector. So move ship loader and random ship selector into the container. So register them as services and then just fetch them out. So there's actually, this is just basically practice. Because the instantiation of these objects is, well, actually, there is one new little thing here. So by the time you're done with this step, unless I'm forgetting something, you should have no new keyword in your controller anymore. All the new blank things should be gone. Everything is being fetched from the container. Even if you weren't using Symfony for your project, by the way, if you have like some random legacy project, you know, obviously this is a pattern that applies to every project, this thing of dependency injection, passing arguments in. And if you are, are in some legacy project, then bring a container into your project. It would be one of the first things I would do with a legacy project. Um, you can bring in Symfony's dependency injection components. Or you could just bring in Pimple, which is a really, really tiny, simple uh, container. Um, especially if you have legacy code, that will probably look good to some of the developers on your team that might like the legacy code. Because Pimple is the, it's just a really small, simple container.
So a lot of you guys are familiar with this, but the only teeny tiny little new thing, if you haven't seen it yet, is how do I tell shiploader that its first constructor argument is a different service? So that's a symphony-specific syntax, but it's the at symbol. So if I didn't have that at symbol on the bottom, if I don't have this at symbol down there, then it's obviously just going to pass it the string my summer camp PDO, which is not how it works. So it's simply a specific thing, you put a path in the front, and it's like, oh, you mean the service called my summer camp PDO, not just the string my summer camp PDO. Again, if you do this and look in the cache container, you're going to see this represented there. Cool. There's a question, which is a good question, so I'll repeat it, about um, sp uh, quotes in YAML. Basically, you rarely need quotes inside YAML. So I have quotes around my arguments. You don't need that. The only time usually that you need quotes is if you are doing something special, like you have an apostrophe, right? You would need to have double quotes probably around apostrophe or single quotes with an escape. So similar to that. Or if I wanted to have, this doesn't make sense, but if you had some argument that actually had spaces in it at the beginning, then you need to have quotes. Because that's actually legal YAML code. You have to have one or more spaces after the dash, but they're all stripped. So that would actually be literally, quote, my title, quote. All the beginning spaces would be off of that. So you almost never have to worry about quotes, but if you're not sure, add some quotes. And then you'll be totally sure how it's going to work, because that's not entirely obvious that what's going to happen there. All right, I'm going to check in and see how everybody's doing in a second, make sure we have people. But I want to ask about the extra credit questions. Um, so setting your PDO services private. First of all, let's do that. So the first extra credit was basically to, it doesn't matter where I do it, was to do that on your service. It's a really small detail. It's just a fun thing to mention. So, uh, so what does public false do? A couple of you now. Go back to you. You're, you're my go-to. It's, it's uh, something you will use to inject into other services. You will not access them directly. These yes. Kinds of services. Shall I repeat? Yeah, might as well. Yeah, repeat. It was a good answer. Yeah, you, if, if, if you don't need your... Uh, if you don't need to access the service directly from the container, or you, you, you will probably use it only to inject into other services, then, then it's a minor performance boost. Perfect. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so it's actually not, not um, entirely necessary, but, but, it, but if, if, if you have hundreds of services, then it, it would just make sense. Yeah, so this is a potential minor performance improvement. The difference when you do public colon false is you can no longer say this arrow container arrow git my summer camp PDO. It'll, it'll say like, it'll pretend like it doesn't exist. So you might be asking yourself then like, what's the point of having this service in the container if I can't access it? It's still accessible as arguments to other services. You just can't access it at runtime from the container itself. So if PDO is meant to really only be an argument to other services, you should never fetch it directly from the container, then you can make it public false, very minor, sometimes none performance improvement. Um, but also, kind of like other things that you make private, like private properties and things like that, it's a signal to other developers that they shouldn't use this. Like, don't use PDO. You're not meant to use it. And then, it's, then I'd say, oh, there must be some other object that PDO gets injected into that I'm supposed to use, some wrapper around it. So, small thing. Um, second question, which is a weird question, but we'll see. Um, so far, we're taking all of our classes and and putting them into the service container. So why not make the normal ship object? Let me change this up here. So one of the other classes is this normal ship object. Why don't we put the normal ship object also into the container? It's a, it's a weird question. I hate, I hate to get it, to get the answer. No, that's fine. Is anybody else? 
Go for it. No, because we we actually need to instantiate these objects. Why? And, yeah, because because we we need to create instances from it. There are there are unique objects. There, there are going to be unique uh, unique objects. But if you have services inside the container, they are singleton. So good. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. So the difference is that some classes are you're meant to have many of them because they're unique. It makes sense to say product A equals new product and set some things on it. Product B equals new product, set other things on it. That makes sense, right? But it doesn't make sense to create two shiploaders. If you want to call a method on shiploader many times, just get one shiploader. Call the method on it many times. So a, a sort of a, a, a thing that ends up happening is that you have two types of objects, objects that you really want to treat as singletons. We don't actually use the singleton pattern exactly, but you only want one of them. Those are true service objects. And then you have other objects, which you can call value objects or model objects. And those are the ones that you're meant to instantiate, because it makes sense to have many of them. Cool? So try to keep those two ideas separate. Um, it's, it's really common to want to mix them. Um, but try to keep in your mind, is this a service object that does work, but does not really hold data, other than maybe a little bit of configuration? Or is this a model object that doesn't do anything, but you know, maybe it does some simple stuff, but basically is there just to hold data. Keep those two ideas separate in your mind. What we don't want to start doing, and it's not the end of the world, but this is where things start to break down a little bit, and I look at legacy code, and it's all totally unpredictable. We don't want to go into the normal ship object, which is a model object, so it should hold data, but not really do any work, and have a method on it like send email. That's work. We don't want to do that in there. No, keep ship really simple. Just have it store data. If you want to email people about their ship, then make some new class, a new service class called the ship emailer. And then have a function on that called send email that has an argument, which is the ship object. So keep those things two separate. If you look at a class and you're not really sure if it's a service class or a model class, then you have maybe have mixed those things together too much. In Symfony, for it's a good thing and a bad thing, it's very difficult to mix those because we don't use any global scope or static context. So if you actually tried to add a like send email function to your normal ship object, it might actually be hard because you would try to access some uh, mailer service object and you wouldn't have access to it. It's possible, but Symfony kind of forces you down the, the correct path. Um, but I have seen some really cool Symfony projects where they have completely broken this rule. They've, gone, they've worked really hard to break all the rules and it's totally possible. So don't do it. Service objects, model objects, two separate things. Don't mix them. Um, or if you do mix them, don't tell them I told you to. Don't, don't blame it on me. OK, next thing. We're going to create, we have uh, four ships. The ships come from a, a database, because uh, when you start the project, I have a little ship table. It has four rows in it. The ship loader, you see, it just iterates over those and creates ship objects from them. We're now going to have a fifth ship, but it's not going to be from the database. So basically, on the screen now, on the home page where we show the ship objects, we're going to have the four from the database, plus we're going to have one new one that's not from the database at all. It's just going to be one where we go into ship loader and instantiate a new object. And this ship is going to be different than the other ships. We're not going to use the normal ship class. We're going to create a new class called Jedi ship. And that's what we're going to instantiate. So we're going to have a new class called Jedi ship. And unlike the normal ship object, its properties aren't dynamic. A Jedi ship is always going to have like a, it's not dynamic. That's why we don't need to store it in the database. It's going to have a static like weapon power, a static defense. So it's just going to return stat static values for those things. So. This step is mostly leading us to our next step. Plus, it's fun to create a class called Jedi Ship. It's probably only opportunity for that. So create a new class called Jedi Ship. For now, make it extend normal ship. Because we need it to have all the same methods as normal ship, because we have parts of our application that are calling those methods. And there's a couple other small things there. But basically, I want you to go into ship loader. And after you query the database for your four ships, create a new Jedi ship and add it to that array. So when I call ship loader, I'm going to get the four normal ships from the database plus one J 
Jedi ship from the database, or Je Jedi ship that's not from the database. Oh, and I guess this is kind of a totally made up project. But the reason we're doing this is because the Jedi ships, they work differently. The Jedi ships, so there's this method on normal ship called does ship use evasive maneuvering? So when they're battling, the ships have an opportunity to basically dodge the attack. Well, Jedi ships are, you know, the piloted by Jedis, and they can feel the attack coming on by using the force. So it's much more likely that they will be able to avoid the attack. So we create this new Jedi class so that this method will cause the Jedi ship to dodge, to evade the attacks with a higher frequency than the normal ships. So this class, this ship, Jedi ship, acts different than the normal ships. It acts much more awesome. Okay. So this step was just, like I said, leading to something else. But the big picture now is that our application calls shiploader. And the fact that shiploader sometimes gets some ships from the database and other times just creates sh ships not from the database doesn't matter to us. In our application, we call shiploader get ships and it returns back to us ship objects. And then we use them. In fact, specifically, it returns back to us normal ship objects. In fact, if you look at the ship loader, that's what the PHP doc says above. It says, at return, normal ship, left square bracket, right square bracket. So it says, just the documentation says, hey, this returns normal ship objects, so that's what you have to deal with. So that's why initially I had you make Jedi ship extend normal ship, because the, sort of the contract in our application says this returns normal ships. So I knew that if we made our Jedi ship have all the same methods as normal ship, in fact, have the same class as normal ship, then we wouldn't break anything in our application. Sort of guaranteed, everyone's expecting a normal ship. The Jedi ship is a normal ship. Jedi ship extends normal ship. So it shouldn't surprise us that everything just works, even though that's not coming from the database. Um, so what's, um, what's the disadvantage of having Jedi ship extend normal ship. Yes? It has the same constructor. has the same constructor. Why don't you like that? Uh, because oh, yeah, good. Uh, the same constructor because Jedi uh, ship can have something quite different, for example, two kind of weapons. Yeah. And we will need to uh, two, uh, one more parameter for the power, power of the second weapon or something like that. Mm -hmm. So probably the constructor will be quite different than in a normal ship. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Like, that's basically it. Like, it's a way of saying the Jedi ship is different than the normal ship. Or if we would like to create a ship with uh, speed, so there will be another, uh, another engine which implies to the speed, so the normal, normal uh, ship will have different speed than the Jedi one. So the Jedi ship and the normal ship are different. What if he's saying, what if we have a... Jedi ship, or we have a different type of ship class that has a, like, speed properties. Maybe we want to have a different constructor with different arguments. It gets a little weird. Um, maybe we have a ship like this. Right now we have a weapon power property. Maybe we have a different ship that, in order to determine its weapon power, it doesn't have a property. It does some different calculation. Like it has a speed and a weapon type properties, and then it does some sort of multiplication to figure those out. So it doesn't, our application doesn't really, it's a little awkward to have Jedi ship extending normal ship because normal ship has a bunch of extra stuff that we don't necessarily need in Jedi ship. Another uh, example of this is, I told you, it's a little weird to have objects this way, but I told you the Jedi ship will always have a weapon power of 10 and a defense of 100. Always. That's just the requirements of our application. So those should really be hard-coded in the class. Right now, we are instantiating a Jedi ship and then calling set weapon power and set defense on there because we sort of have to. That's how the normal ship is set up. The normal ship has those as dynamic properties, so we set those dynamic properties. So there's some restrictions because Jedi ship just doesn't really act like normal ship, but we're sort of forcing it to right now. Let me fix my screen up here because I forgot to tell my computer to not sleep. That'll do it.
good. So thinking about our application calls shiploader get ships because it needs ships to do certain jobs. It needs ships for two reasons. It needs ships so that it can display them on the home page, and then it needs them again so that it can select two random ships to fight each other, and that calls methods on there. So we have to think about what are the methods or what are the public things, either public methods or public properties on normal ship that our application actually needs. Like for example, our application, meaning everything outside of ship loader, our application doesn't need the normal ship object to have a set weapon power method. Other than in ship loader, that's never used afterwards. It, we call ship loader get ships, it returns us those normal ship objects, we never call set weapon power on there. We do call get weapon power and get defense, that happens inside of the battle manager. If you look inside of there, it calls those when they're fighting each other. Um, and it also calls a couple other methods like does ship use evasive maneuvering? So there are several public functions on the normal ship we use, and there are other public functions that we don't use. So I just want us to think about like what does our ship loader get ships actually need to return? It needs to return an object with just some of those methods, but it's not as important if other methods are on that object or not. So there's two things we're going to do with this, and I'm going to have you guys break in one second. Oh, yeah, cool, cool, cool. There's two ways we can solve this, and we're actually going to get to both of them, but we're going to kind of move up right now. Um, hold on, let me, let me cheat here real quick, because I want to make sure I'm not missing a uh, step up. Oh. Okay, there's one other t small duplication, and that's that... Actually, no, it's not. Never mind. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking and actually just get you guys to the next step because ma everything makes more sense anyways. So one way to solve this is, and it's not necessarily the best way, but we're going to talk about that's going to be interfaces, and we're going to talk about that and get there. One way to solve this is to have both of these, instead of having Jedi ship extend normal ship, you have some abstract class. And Jedi ship extends the abstract class, and normal ship extends that abstract class. And the abstract class has the actual methods and only the methods that our application needs. So if we do this, then we don't have to have Jedi ship extend normal ship. They both just extend abstract ship. And what's important about that is that our ship loader now will change the documentation on it to say ship loader returns abstract ship. So we no longer, when we make a new ship class, we no longer have to make it extend normal ship. We just need it to make extend abstract ship. And abstract ship has just the methods that it has to have. It doesn't have all the extra methods that maybe one needs and the other one doesn't need. So do that. Create a new abstract ship class. And if you're familiar with interfaces, this is getting very close to interfaces, and we are going to get there. And why those five methods in the abstract class? This is, if you guys actually looked at the application long enough, you guys would determine those same five methods. Because if you look everywhere in our application where we call methods on the normal ship object, those are the five methods we actually call. Okay, the ship loader calls other methods as it's, as it's preparing them, but once we call get ships and get the return value, those are the only five methods that we call anywhere in our application. So anything that gets returned from get ships just has to have those five methods. As long as it has those five methods, we don't care if it has a set defense or how that works. So those will be five abstract methods inside of that class. So now when you have Jedi ship extends abstract ship, the methods like get weapon power and get defense can return hard-coded values because that's what we want. So in Jedi ship, your get weapon power will just say return 10. That's it. It's not dynamic. The Jedi ship is not meant to be dynamic in this application. That's kind of a requirement I'm telling you guys. I know that's a little weird to have an object that's not dynamic. <laughs> 